Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Hearts of Iron 4 Millennium Dawn with me, Alpha Pi Omega, in Ukraine. So let me start this episode by thanking you all for the wonderful comments, supports and likes. I am very happy that you're enjoying the Let's Play, even though I got some negative comments booing me and so on, but hey. I decided to do a little <laughs> controversial topic here on YouTube, so I understand that some people don't find it uh, nice. But I'm here with another episode and some more information about Ukraine, which I would like to talk about because I'm starting a new session and probably two or three episodes today. So uh, the first one, as usual, will have some news and some things that I dug up in the previous day. And uh, the two following will be probably full on playthrough. So anyway, before we start, uh, I wanted to uh, speak a bit about our strategy. Now, I don't know when we actually uncovered that, but we have the Western Doctrine now available, which is another one that would uh, give us political power. So we now have three. We have... EU policies, we have uh, Western Doctrine, and we have the Foreign Policy Initiative. So all of these are kind of cool, uh, but I decided that first of all, we have to finish up the chain of national focuses that we have here, because we definitely need the military factories. However, one unexpected problem has arisen. Now, you know that we now have five uh, naval dockyards. Well, the entire point of while we were going through this was to revive our navy and get the extra naval dockyard. We can't because I can't read. I thought that it said five or more and it says just more. So that is a problem and we won't be able to rectify that until, well, very late in the future. But anyway, uh, backtracking. The five dockyards that we have now consume an insane amount of steel way more than we are actually producing and this one is probably lack of resources eight percent reduction efficiency is down by eight percent oh that's not that bad eight percent if i'm reading that correctly is not that bad so i think we can wing it for now we can start with the military factories and then um, get more steel but we really need to therefore upgrade our infrastructure we do have some steel production okay so this would give us just one I just I would give us just one just one here and two in Donbass so we're potentially looking at one two three four five extra steel which is not bad and I think that there's a lot to be said for the resource wait, uh, resource extraction technologies that would give us 7.5, 7.5, some yeah, okay, so we can pretty much double it by the end of the game. Oh, maybe not double, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's roughly 60 extra percent. So that's not that bad. That's not that bad. It could give us a lot to work with here. Okay, anyway, let's uh, let's ignore that for now and continue with the military focuses. Now, I'm mostly interested in national armor production. I think that's the one that we want to get right now. So national armor production we're going to get that gives us two military factories. The new points for the UAF are also pretty good. That's additional military factory. But um, I don't have any ambition to start producing aircraft at this point, so why would I do that? Instead, I think we might want to go with Ruffinian steel and maybe Zaporozhye industrial plants after that, because that's something that we really need right now. You notice that we actually don't have enough steel. And we can invest uh, a bit into our research. We're missing like six, I think. Yeah, so that would be four if we get an extra technology we're producing for the six. So yeah, that's going to be definitely enough with one extra tech. So let's um, let's go with the national armor production. Producing our armored vehicles here at home will be by far the best and cheapest way to arm our ground forces with tanks and IFVs. Several companies in Kiev alone have started to produce armored vehicles for the Ukrainian military. It is smart to invest and award them government contracts. So we will get one research bonus for all armor 
and one extra military factor in Odessa and one in Zaporozhye. Now, while I understand what they are saying, and I agree with the fact that awarding your own companies the contracts for uh, military is a very good idea that can rapidly and nicely can boost your you know local economy. There is a lot to be said for quality of work. Now, I cannot speak about the Ukrainian arms producers, and that is actually something that I can check and speak about in the next episode. If I, Well, not the next one, but in the next session, if I remember that. But um, yeah, I'll have to, have to look into that, because I don't know how well they are. Uh, there is a lot to be said for Western manufacturers, and by Western manufacturers, I don't mean, for example, my country. My country is great in producing small arms. I know about that. It's worldwide known. But, for example, I know that the German tanks are awesome, or you can get, you know, some pretty nice thing in the United States. You know, just just know what, what you're getting. And, you know, again, no critique for Ukrainian arms producers. Plus, most of these things are anyway produced, you know, uh, through licensing. So I wouldn't worry about that that much. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about today are two topics. Uh, you know that we have started with the... Uh, with the chain that starts with... Okay, with Ukrainian elections... Western outlook, okay. With the lessons of the Tuzla Island conflict. Now, that happened actually in 2003, so we were right on point, maybe a bit ahead because I think we started in 2002, but it started in early 2003. And I was kind of interested in what this is and why I never heard about it, and I kind of found out why the Tuzla Island is in here somewhere. It's an extremely small, like like a tiny little island. And what this conflict was about was that Russia started building a dam from their own territory into uh, the sea and onto that island, basically uh, connecting it with their territory. Now, while that doesn't sound that bad, in fact, in, in de facto means that they would connect that island to Russia and annex it. I have no idea why they were doing that, if it was just a provocation or anything, but uh, they started doing that, and while they were doing it, they sent a ship to survey the area, and because it reached into the Ukrainian uh, territorial waters, it was seized by Ukraine and uh, detained, uh, later on returned to Russia, so there were some high-level meetings, everything cleared out in the end. But I was kind of confused why this is such a big deal here. It's um, I, w- I would understand if this this was like a Crimean, uh, you know, lessons of the Crimean conflict or something. But there was actually no fight for what I could find. There was never really... Ultimately, the Ukrainian people lost the de jure land. It is now effectively Russian. Well... I'm, I'm not sure why it would spark such a such a big. And if it did, maybe I'm mistaken. But from what I saw, I, I didn't see that it would influence Ukrainian politics that much, or do, you know, it wasn't that much of a deal. Basically, it, it was an international uh, dispute, but you know, nothing nothing major. So I don't really know what the problem there was. Kind of interesting still though. Today, the bridge uh, from you know between Novorossiysk and um, uh, Simferopol is located partly on that Tuzo Island. It, it goes right above it, so it's a bit of a historical significance there for you. Anyway, foreigners killed by jihadists in Kyrgyzstan. Tens of people have been killed or wounded following the jihadist gun and bomb attack on a housing complex for expatriate workers. Kyrgyz security for... Oh, it's the same description. Yeah, okay. Radical decision increases by a medium amount. Okay, it's the same thing. And we have Estonian elections, Western outlook in Estonia. Okay, that's good. So, so the Tuzla conflict was was something that uh, really didn't happen. But from the sound of it, and from the effects in the game, I was expecting that it was a military conflict, something like Donbass. But it wasn't at all. It was just just a negotiation and and seizing of one ship, and then high level meetings and arbitration. It's kind of 
kind of weird, you know, from from how they model it here. But it's definitely interesting in in the sense that how Russia acted and. Yeah, it's hard to take that not seriously when they're trying to annex. And and Tuzla Island is actually uninhabited, as far as I understood. There was nothing there. And after this uh, this dispute, the Kerch uh, city was supposed to build a settlement there, but they eventually rejected it because it made absolutely no sense to have anyone stationed on the island. So in the end, you know, as uh, Crimea was uh, you know, taken by Russia in 2014, this dispute lost its complete meaning but still a little bit of tidbit from history between these two nations even in 2003 russia was i don't know again in pure speculation but the way they they acted it seemed like they're encroaching into uh into ukraine so make of that what you will improved computing research speed increased but by five percent so now we could go with advanced computing but that would be ahead of time. So instead, let's backtrack and start with the excavation because we really need that extra uh, extra uh, resources that we're going to get from that. Actually, that should give us something like free extra steel, which is pretty good. Combined with that um, national focus, it's going to be pretty good. Wow, and this one is going to be finished very soon as well. So good for us. What are we doing on the arms production anyway 5.57 per day so let's see how far we can get it we're lacking only 7700 something now <laughs> article 15 article 50 is triggered sweden has triggered article 50 and will leave the european Union in two years okay so that's fun that's exactly why this game is so unpredictable why would why would they leave? Is that nationalist outlook? Okay, well, Sweden can go. It's the first one to exit the EU, and the new countries are not getting there yet. Okay, we're still bleeding on money. Our debt is increasing slowly. But as we're building the extra factories, we will soon be able to, uh, to up our economy, hopefully. So industrial electrospun polymeric nanofibers are done. So do we want to do excavation too or do we want to go with this one? I think we want to go with this one, definitely. Multivolt multi carbon nanotubes. Nanotubes are used for conductors in electrical apparatuses. A apparatuses, that's a weird word. Apparatuses, antennas for radios and other electromagnetic devices. So let's see, you now have five extra percent production efficiency. Okay, we can get, in my opinion, to about seven guns per day, which is pretty good. Pretty good. And yeah, even this output has been increased. So, 8th of May now. So let's see, six, uh, six per day. Yeah, the efficiency is going to increase. So we're gonna get additional, yeah, definitely over seven. Now it keeps telling me that I'm producing obsolete um, things. That's because of the Krivak class two, because we already got Krivak class three. So I have to up, upgrade those two ships eventually to that class. Uh, so yeah, data mining is gonna be next. And how far are we in the national arm production? Okay, when are we gonna throw that in though? That is a big question. So we're gonna be done in about 100, wait, what, not 100 days, we need to, okay, the anti-tank missiles will be done soon. I guess we're gonna put one into small arms, one into utility vehicles, and, yeah, let's put one into utility vehicles because we need to up that production. This is this is just sad. So we're gonna get to about one per day. So we're looking at a year and a half for that, and one more into small arms. So that way we're getting to about nine per day. If uh, my calculation, my educated aspo is correct. So that would be about nine per day, which is good. You know, it is good. 
So with the national armor production done, uh, we're going to backtrack a bit on our military and go to get Rufinian steel. So let's get that. We're still, yeah, we're missing nine steel now. Starting to feel a bit bad that I didn't go with the uh, with the excavation too as well, but well, we're gonna get there. Advancements in drilling techniques allow us to excavate resources that were impossible to reach earlier. Well, yay for us! Yay for us! So, how are the Americans doing in that conflict? They still didn't manage to breach through Basra. It's kind of interesting. I think they can attack from both of these. And the conflict is only over Basra. So, I guess it might be pretty hard to supply in that area. I wish we could see what's happening there. It would be kind of cool to follow that up. Okay, stability is at six, 46%. I think we can invest a bit more into the stability of the regime. Uh, we are actually working with the yeah the support campaigns, so there's no point in putting that up again. Sunday in the National Guard. Raises the boat of the regime by five. Raises chances of revolt by four. It actually increases the... That's interesting. It increases the... Uh, I... The, the opinion of the uh, of the oligarchs and of farmers of Petro Poroshenko from negative to indifferent hmm requires less than 60% stability of the regime well we don't really need that at this point do we so so we want to attack the influence um I think I'm gonna start saving this to drop the corruption because that is something that's really bugging us we're bleeding up money pretty badly and we need to keep an eye on that i don't think we need any any investment into research or anything so let's just keep it as it is let's just keep it as it is so yeah there's more i guess they might have like a border conflict or something in Kitchen. I don't know how that is set up or how it works. Oh, look at that. Okay. So what is this? That's Myanmar as well. And they're fighting with Bohemia of the Karen state. Interesting, and there's also what is this one? Shan State. I guess there's a lot of a lot of little uprisings or rebel groups. Interesting, De definitely interesting to see that. So how's the Americans doing? Nothing. Still locked in that area. What about the conflict in Africa, Congo? They're making definitely a lot of progress there. Liberia, the same thing. Belarusian election. Alexander Lukashenko <laughs> re elected. And Cypriot election. Kovkos Kveridis re elected. Okay, so I guess that's the. Oh damn, Belgian. That's Western Outlook and Democratic. In Dutch with Western Outlook. So how are you as the Northern Cyprus scene? Ralph Denktas. Western Outlook as well, really? Interesting. That is a little little interesting state right there. So 221 power. The Rufinian steel will be done soon. Data mining will be done soon. And how's the production? Sudan declared war on Sudan. Okay, we're at eight and a half guns per day. That's awesome. And we're stockpiling the anti tank guns. So that's pretty good. That is pretty good. 
Okay, so Sudan is now not only at war with South Sudan, but also with Sudan itself. Yeah, everyone, it's it's everyone against everyone. So Sudan against Sudan against South Sudan. So that's the continuation of the uh, Sudan uh, Sudanese civil war. Damn, there's a lot of fighting taking place there. That's brutal. That is brutal. So Ruffinian steel will be ready now. Thank you for that. Oh, that removes 10 billion from our treasury. That's something that I probably should have accounted for, but okay. <laughs> okay, now let's just go with the... Oh, we can't divest an Altuk anymore. Damn, missed that opportunity. So let's go with the foreign policy initiative. Actually, did we read what that uh, Ruffinian steel said? Ruffinian steel was once a formidable product meant for waging war. Now we no longer fight with swords and shields. However, our tanks, guns, and our bullets need quality steel to remain competitive. Well, that's true. So foreign policy initiative. Foreign powers deciding for we have dominated oh, our foreign policy. We should push... Th there's a lot of typos in these texts. We should push to discuss more pro-Ukrainian foreign policy and decide what is best for us. So extra political power and stability of the regime. So let's do that. And the data mining will be done soon, right? How are we now on the production? Okay. Still missing a bit of steel, but... Okay. Not yet, actually. Did we get the Ruffinian steel? Where was that supposed to pop up? Uh, uh, um. Zakarpatia. In for in. Okay, we got it. Yeah, yeah, we got it. So did we, in the meantime, increase our production even further? 41, yeah, we, we had to. That's interesting. So we're not keeping up with our demand. Uh, so data mining has been finished. That gives us extra research speed and production efficiency growth. I think we're going to go with the excavation too for now because we really, really need to get more resources on the market. New techniques help us collect resources more efficiently. We no longer taint the resources upon extraction, leading to a better yield. Yeah, I know, we're missing, we're missing stuff. And we're also spending too much damn. Uh, by this, by this, uh, if, if we go ahead at this speed, we're going to have to increase taxes more. High level summit held between Turkey and Oman. Following weeks of backdoor negotiations, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has arrived in Oman to meet with his counterpart, Kabos bin Said Al Said. Many see the summit as the first step towards greater Omani-Turkish cooperation and possibly heralding a significant change in the geopolitics of the Middle East and a notable increase in Turkish regional influence. Power dynamics are shifting. They truly are. Anyway, I also have one more topic for uh, today that I researched, which was uh, the operations of the Ukrainian army. Now, that's something that I am kind of interested in. I was reading uh, on that quite extensively. And uh, I have to say that um, I was impressed. Now, the Ukrainian army took uh, part in the Yugoslavian war. Oh. Sudan was next by the Khartoum Caliphate. Holy hell. Omar al -Kabil. So let's hope that the South Sudan will, <laughs> will de defend. SEO launches large-scale military exercises. Chinese troops joined thousands of others today in what is being described as a counter-terrorism exercise under the auspices of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
While many have hailed these exercises as a symptom of successful international cooperation, others have reacted much worse and enthusiastically to this latest development. American and European analysts cited the deployment of long-range aircraft and substantial firepower as evidence that these exercises are meant not as practice for counter-terror operations, but as a well-armed dress rehearsal for confrontation with the West. Okay. Well, anyway, as I was saying, uh, Ukraine has been presenting the Yugoslavian wars. Their forces uh, were serving there under IFOR uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Umprofor and Untaas in Croatia, and also in Kosovo. And they were also present in the Middle East, in uh, Lebanon, and in Kuwait and Iraq. So that was kind of interesting. And also in Africa in Angola, uh, which is here. I guess that might have been even in that conflict that we have seen. And in Sierra Leone and Liberia. So maybe even these conflicts. Um, especially because, you know, the, the timing seems right. But I haven't really, really gotten that much deeper into it. Because believe it or not, not much is on the internet in English about these operations. Now, what... I actually know is that uh, the deployment around the world was um, marked in um, in the year 2009, and at that date, uh, Ukraine had 540 uh, servicemen or military personnel around the world in eight peacekeeping missions. So that was kind of interesting to read that they were so active uh, before the Crimean crisis in the world affairs. Pretty pretty good for a country that is almost isolationist at the start of the game, right? I don't think there was much more... Where was that? Here, local security. Yeah, only one step above that, and that's isolation. So jihadists killed foreigners in Kyrgyzstan again. Damn. Okay, and we're starting to get a pretty nice amount of political power here. That's good. Okay, our stability of the regime is 72%. Uh, so let's actually do one more support campaign. Because if we do two more, we can remove the uh, course of Novorossiya, which are, I believe, in Crimea. Yeah, and Donbass. And Sloboda Ukraine. Interesting. That would be a Luhansk, right? No, Luhansk is in Donbass. They do have foreign claims. Wow, they actually have foreign claims in all of Eastern. Damn, okay, is that what this uh, Russian actions can lead to? What was that, Ukraine? that they can go ahead and just create a puppet state? I guess I'll... Oh, here it is. Seize Crimea. Yeah, the Novorossian uprising. Requires... Seize Crimea. Requires over 5% chance of revolt in Ukraine. And we get... Even the Ukrainian civil war. Okay, demand the Baltic world to annex Russia. Yeah, okay, so they can come for us, which is pretty damn bad. That is actually one question. If they go after Crimea, do we have a chance in that? Seize Crimea gets a bit. Okay, the invasion of Crimea. Huh, interesting. So they can come, come after us. And we will probably have a chance to fight back. Which is something that I would really like. Okay, I'm thinking we're gonna cancel this one for now. And put it in the C3 equipment, the command equipment. Because that one is taking a bit too long. Yeah, we need we need way more. We need at least one per day. This way we're going to get to about one and a half. 
So once we get uh, these small arms, I'm going to dedicate some of those uh, production capacities into that one. But right now we're having a pretty good outlook that in about a year and something, uh, we're going to have the uh, all of the uh, utility um, utility vehicles done and the man pads will be done. So these can be also distributed into the C3 and small arms. And then once that is done, we'll start researching technologies and refitting our armies. Now, I think that our units, yeah, their combat capacities have greatly increased if you look at that. Most of them are at reasonable fighting strength right now. Nothing that crazy. Uh, the units still need to be... need to be reinforced, but this is... So this is our basic infantry unit. It seems that way. Yeah. So that's white infantry unit with engineer battalion and a self-propelled air defense battery. Okay. This is a smaller one. This is a brigade with artillery and recon company. So the first step would be to throw in some mechanized recon companies to all of these because it's going to greatly help with defense and everything. Uh, but it's going to require quite a lot of extra things. Infantry fighting vehicles. Okay, we do have them in storage. More command equipment, more, uh, more handheld Anti-air guns, self-propelled, no, not those, but uh, anti-tank guns and small arms. So we could do this one. The mechanized recon is doable. There's also, there's also armored recon, which gives less defense and soft attack, but more hard attack. Less suppression, no, yeah, less suppression requires tanks. What about the recon value? 2.3 with both, okay. Self propelled. Yeah, we might throw, we might try to create something a bit more, a bit more workable here. It's gonna be quite a lot of work to put this together, but um, we're having some. Mm, nice, that's actually a full recon battalion here. I like that. And these are the mechanized, no, armored infantry. Yeah, mechanized and armored infantry with recon and motorized ads. I like this because um, the game provides you with some interesting templates here to play around with. Aeromobilnaya Brigada, so this is a par wait what? This is a paratrooper brigade combined with mechanized infantry. That doesn't make any sense. So this can be completely changed. And here we have what? Oh, okay. It's uh Povitria do Satna Brigada. So airborne Armored Airborne Infantry with self-propelled air defense artillery. Yeah, and it doesn't make any sense because you either have the entire unit able uh, to do that or you don't. But, you know, going halfway like this is, is senseless a bit. Okay, so let's finish the Foreign Policy Initiative and end the episode. We're going to be at something like 100, no, actually 400, uh, 400 political power. Which will put us fairly close to being able to get rid of that corruption and bump it down to widespread. I would like that. I would like that. So, what about the Western Western Doctor? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. So, we could go with Consolidation. Okay, we propose this Baltic Black Sea or Euroscepticism. I don't want to do that. I actually want to join the EU. Okay, there's more military factories here, but we need the money for that and we don't have that. 
enough to go see it. It all costs money. Uh, since 2004, um, okay, let's just go with the EU policies. The policies of the EU are determined by the Union's values, objectives, and principles. Because the EU started as an economic community, economic policy is still as an important area in the EU. In keeping with its values, the EU seeks to promote the well-being, security and interests of the citizens. The EU wishes to keep the economy stable and competitive. The EU tries to reform itself. Okay. The policies of the EU. Well, this is going to give us extra political power and that's something that we desperately need. So let's do that. Now the construction is... Okay, struggling again. Uh, have we... We're running the support campaigns, which is good. I think we're gonna go with the... Oh, it costs 5 billion now. Damn. Reason of map. How long are we looking at? Too far? Wow, more than a year. Hmm. Well, I'll have to think, well... Well, we'll have to wait for the corruption. Once we take down the corruption, I'm gonna see what the budget is like and then we're gonna decide based on that. Anyway, thank you for joining me for this episode and I'll see you in the next one. So, join me then.